Hi. Glad you're back after all the mummies. I promise no more mummies for a while. What I'd like to do is bring us back to the chronological picture again, trying to proceed through 3,000 years of recorded Egyptian history. Um, when we last left off our chronological history, we had the end of the 18th dynasty. Now, let's recap a little bit. We had Akhenaten, the heretic pharaoh, try to change the three basic pivot points of Egyptian society. You know, he tried to change the role of the pharaoh, the military, and religion. After 17 years, it was a failed experiment. His son, Tutankhamun, being advised by a senior advisor, I, A-Y-E, goes back to the old religion, moves the capital back to Thebes, and life goes on as normal. After Tutankhamun, we saw the old vizier, I, marry Tutankhamun's widow, Ankhesenamun. He's an old man, I, only reigns for three years, and then he dies. He's succeeded by Horemheb, a military man. Now, this is not an unusual thing even today, that when there's a weakness in the government, the military steps in and takes over. That's where the power is. That's where the stability is. So Horemheb, a military man, really seizes power and becomes king of Egypt. But as we also saw, we had an unusual circumstance. We had three kings of Egypt in a row with no children. Tutankhamun, no successor. I, no children, no successor. Horemheb, no children, no successor. And Egypt saw that this was a bad thing. So the next dynasty, dynasty 19, is going to make sure this doesn't happen again. And that's why they choose as the next king of Egypt, Ramses I. So let's start with Ramses I. First of all, he is a commoner, right? He has no royal blood, because nobody has royal blood anymore. Horemheb was a commoner. He's a commoner. He was the vizier of Egypt, though, to Horemheb. So he's friends of Horemheb. And Ramses I's father was a general. So he's a military man of sorts. So what we've got, really, is somebody who is a friend of Horemheb, the vizier, who knows how to run the government. Military connections. Becomes king of Egypt. He's an old man, though. He's not going to last long. But I think the reason they pick him is... Not just that he's the vizier and knows how to run the country, not just that he's militarily connected, but remember, Egypt had been thrown into turmoil because they didn't have a successor. Ramses I is picked as king of Egypt because he's got a son and a grandson. So at least for two generations, we know there's going to be a succession and royal blood can start. Right. So Ramses is king of Egypt. Doesn't last for long, as I say, three years or so. His wife, by the way, there's a nice innovation during his reign. His wife, a lady named sit Ray, is the first queen. She's queen of Egypt. She's the wife of, of Ramses I. This is not Ramses the Great, by the way. It's Ramses I. You'll see. She's buried in the Valley of the Queens. This is a new innovation. Just as Tutmosis I was the first pharaoh to be buried in the Valley of the Kings, there is now going to be a separate burial place for the queens of Egypt. And she is the first inhabitant of the Valley of the Queens. But as I say, Ramses dies after only three years. We can't say much about his reign. But his son is a great king. The first great king of this dynasty, Seti I. Now, he probably had served as vizier, just like his father, serving Egypt, so he knew how to run a country. And he's, he's a curious case, and let me say why. His name. His name is a little bit of a problem, just a little. Seti, Seti. Sounds like the god, Seth, right? It is. Seti means I of Set, meaning I'm a follower of Set. Now, it's not quite a usual name, not very common. There were people who had the name Seti. Grandfather had the name Seti. There are people who had the name Seti. But it is a little unusual. 
And remember, these have been turbulent times. We had had a heretic king, lots of turmoil. So Seti wants to show that he's going to be a traditional king. And as an extra name, he has a name that means renaissance. We've seen that once before. He's going to say, it's a renaissance. We're coming back. It's going to be good. And he marries a woman, Tuya, and they have children. The thing to remember for right now, he has a son that dies young. He has a daughter named Tia who will live to be an adult, and another son who's going to be Ramses the Great. This is the father of Ramses the Great, Seti I. Anyway, Seti knows what to do. He goes to battle, right? just like the 18th dynasty had. He marches to Syria, and he conquers a town that's very important in Syria, Kadesh. Kadesh. It's a town that had been controlled by Hittites. Now, the Hittites are the ones from Turkey. They had controlled it somewhat, but he takes, takes control of Kadesh. Kadesh is an interesting site, by the way. It's on a hill. It's one of these towns that's been built up over thousands of years, and it's mounds, it's mounds. But he goes to Syria, and he returns with captives. And he has battle scenes on his temple walls. He shows himself as a warrior. Right? He knows what to do. But he's a builder, loves to build, builds some of the most important things in Egypt. And today, I want to tell you not just about what said he builds, but what an Egyptian temple was like what it was like to be inside one of these things. First thing he does is he builds at Karnak Temple. Now Karnak, remember, we've mentioned it several times, is on the eastern bank of Thebes and was becoming the largest temple in the world. Karnak is not to be viewed as a temple. View it as a temple complex. Temple next to temple next to temple, over 100 acres. A huge, sprawling temple complex. A very important place. It's where the god Amun lived. There were different precincts even. It was so large. There was a precinct for Amun. There was a precinct for his wife, Mut. There was a precinct for their son, Hansu. There was a sacred lake, a place where the, 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 the shrine, the bark shrine could be put on the water. It was a beautiful place. And Pharaoh after Pharaoh, to gain favor with the gods, had built his own temple. It doesn't make sense as a whole complex. You walk and you go left, you go right. Temple after temple after temple. Right? And said he's going to build there. He builds the hypostyle hall, the famous hypostyle hall. Now, the word hypostyle, it's an architectural term. All it means is it supports a ceiling. Right? It has a roof. Right? And this is the place where you have these massive columns. The columns are literally so massive that a hundred men can stand on the top of one. That's how big they are around. hundred men can stand on the top of a column. Seti builds this hypostyle hall. And it must have been a beautiful place. You know, when you see it today, when the tourists see it today, the color is gone. But it was once brightly painted. And you had papyrus painted on these columns, looking like they were almost growing out of the ground. And you had Seti's cartouche. It was a beautiful place. So he builds at Karnak Temple. Now, something about temple life and the priests who inhabited these walls. First, any Egyptian temple, any Egyptian temple was basically off limits to the commoner. It wasn't, as I said once before, like a church where everybody's supposed to go. They're happy if you show up. They're thrilled if you show up on Sunday. No. This was a place where the gods lived. You didn't do your worshiping there every day. You didn't do it once a week. Maybe you went there on a festival day and you were allowed into the open courtyard at best. Egyptian temples were generally built like a railroad flat, straight, one axis. Usually there were three parts to a temple. And Karnak, as I say, is temple after temple. So what you've got is lots of these. Usually it's three parts to an Egyptian temple. First, you would always go through a pylon anyway, the big gate where the king could put the great deeds that he had done. You go through the pylon, and then you're in the open courtyard, the first part of a temple. Open to the sky, large open area. This is where, if it was a festival day, you might be permitted in, where they would bring out the statue of the god to the open courtyard, and then maybe you'd get a glimpse of it as the priest carried it. Next, you enter into the next chamber, which is an enclosed courtyard. It's roofed over. 
And it's getting dark. It's getting more mysterious. And then the third chamber, the Holy of Holies. This is where the cult statue was kept. And the statue is called the God. It's not just a statue of the God. It's the God. Now, these statues were usually bronze, sometimes gold. If they were bronze, they were gilded. And they were kept in a little shrine with doors that opened and closed. And only the priests, the high priests, were allowed into this holy of holies where the God lived. Now, the God had to be fed, clothed, perfumed. And that was the job of one class of priests called the stolists, as in stole, wearing a stole around your neck, around your shoulders. These were the stolists who were in charge of the God's clothes. In the morning, there were rituals twice a day. In the morning, you would go into the Holy of Holies, if you were the priest, open the doors, say the prayers, place some food before the God, put cosmetics perhaps on the eyes, perfumes, and then the God would be ready for the daily activities. And you would do this several times a day. So this was a place where the living God inhabited. Now, in addition to this railroad flat type place, this three rooms, there were some changes, some alterations of this. But almost always around any large temple was an enclosure wall. And between the temple area and the enclosure wall was often where priests actually lived. Some of them lived there. But more important, they were temple workshops. It was a hive of activity. For example, priests only wore white linen. That was the garment of a priest. Pure white linen. Remember, by the way, the Egyptians didn't have cotton. No cotton in ancient Egypt. It's linen, which is made from the flax plant. So the priests wore white linen robes. Or a high priest could wear a leopard skin. The workshops is where they wove the linen. There were workshops all around. There were places that made garments for the priests. So it was a busy place. Now, the priests themselves, we have to understand, you know, when, when Seti I is going to build his temple at Karnak, we have to understand the mentality of what's going on, what he's going to try to do. Priests in ancient Egypt were not people who had a higher calling. They were not people who were dedicated to the God in a religious sense. No. They were people who were doing a job. They were professionals. And this probably comes from the earliest days of Egyptian civilization, when the pharaoh was the high priest of everything. And during the year, the pharaoh would have to have all the rituals. He would perform all the rituals. He would go up and down on a boat on the Nile and stop at temples, and he would perform the various ceremonies that made sure that divine order rested in Egypt. At some point, obviously, the culture grew too big for the pharaoh to go everywhere. He couldn't do it. That's the beginning of the priesthood of Egypt. He needed a stand-in, or several stand-ins, to go up and down the Nile and do the ceremony, say the rituals. So the priests begin originally as a stand-in for the pharaoh. They don't have to have any great calling or connection with the god. The pharaoh's the only one with the connection who's really connected. These stand-ins are going to go up and down and act. They're going to be like actors, theatricals that are going to be performed. So the priests really don't have to have conviction. And this remained the status quo in Egypt for thousands of years. Priests did not have to have a feeling of a higher calling. So these were guys who were doing a job. This is why, by the way, and it surprises people when they read this, many of the important positions of a priest, like a, a high priest of a certain temple, many of the important positions were hereditary. You had it, your son would get it. It was a good job. It didn't matter that he was an alcoholic. It didn't matter that he caroused with women. It didn't matter. He could still show up at the right time, say the right words, and the business with the gods would have been conducted. So priests are not to be viewed. Don't think when every time you hear, oh, he was a priest, he must have been a holy man. No way. So the priests were people just like other commoners, just like the laymen, but they knew the words to say. Right? So when Seti builds at Karnak, this hyperstyle hall, it's a bustling place, temples all over the place, and priests 
fighting with each other. The priests often vied with each other to say, my God is better than your God. So there was a lot of competition, and if you were a really good priest, you could make a lot of money because the temples had land, and the land was given to the priests. Right? So you had plenty of chance to rise if you were a priest. So our man Seti builds at Karnak, a good place to build, showing I'm establishment. But he also builds a temple at Abydos in the south. Now remember, Abydos was the sacred place where Osiris was buried. This was the most holy of all cities in Egypt. Every Egyptian wanted to be buried at Abydos. Of course they couldn't. So if you weren't buried at Abydos, you would send a little statue or something to be buried there. So Seti, when he decides to build his big temple at Abydos, is making a political statement. He's saying, I'm main line. It's back to the good old times. It's no more Akhenaten, forget him. We're going to traditional gods. Now he builds a beautiful temple at Abydos. Beautiful. It is, in many ways, the most beautiful temple in Egypt. And the reason, I think, is that, remember during the reign of Akhenaten, our heretic pharaoh, the artists were given free reign. They weren't sort of hindered by tradition. And you got some beautiful work during that period. Those artists were still alive. Those artists who had been allowed to give free reign to their creativity were alive, and they are probably the guys who do the paintings at Abydos Temple. So you still have artists who have been given creative freedom, but now they're going to apply it to traditional scenes. So he builds a beautiful temple at Abydos, spectacular. Now, one of the interesting features of the temple, there's plenty of interesting features about this temple, is the king's list. Remember, pharaohs were always very proud of their heritage. They loved to list, I'm the 112th king, and here's 11, 111, here's 110, tracing back their lineage. There's a great king's list at Abydos, in the Hall of the Ancients. Right? Traces the kings from Narmer to Seti I. It's rather beautiful, by the way. You all, it's a long hall, and all you have are cartouches of the kings, like the Hall of Records, it's called. And there you see Seti I. He's about to read the names of his ancestors. Right? Once a year, you would read the names of the ancestors so they would all have food and drink in the next world. And in front of him is a little kid, a prince, who's helping him. That prince is going to be Ramses the Great. Right? But if you look carefully, if you read the names in the cartouches on the king's list, you'll see plenty. You won't see... Akhenaten, you won't see Tutankhamun, you won't see I, you won't see them. They didn't exist. It's as if they never existed. Right? You know who you also won't see? Hatshepsut. She's missing too because Egypt just couldn't allow it to be said that we had a woman who ruled as king. But he built, he has this lovely, lovely king's list. I mean, it's beautiful, highly polished, really quite something. So, but that's not all that's at Abydos. There's plenty at Abydos. He also builds, right? He also builds, right? Chapels within his temple at Abydos. It's, it's really quite an, interesting, quite an interesting place. And there are plenty of gods in the back. Let me tell you the gods that he has. There are sanctuaries to Re Horachti, who is, which, Hor Achti, Horus of the Horizon. It's a composite god. It's Re, the sun god, and Horus of the Horizon. There's a chapel for him. There's one for Amun Re. Amun Re, the composite. Amun, the hidden one, and Re. There's one for Horus, Isis, Osiris, Ptah, and there's one more. Seti himself. He is sitting there with the gods just like them. Right? So Seti is going to be quite a king. He builds the hypostyle hall at Karnak. He builds the temple at Abydos. He beats up on the Syrians. He, great king, great king. But behind his temple is one of the strangest monuments in all of Egypt, and nobody to this day is sure what's going on with it. Let me describe it. There are two theories about this monument, but let me describe the monument first, I'll give you the two theories, and then you can decide which theory sounds most reasonable. 
First, the monument is behind Abydos, as I said. It's right behind the temple. But it's 30 feet beneath the ground level. In other words, if you were to walk right out of Abydos Temple and keep running, you'd fall 30 feet. So it's well beneath the ground level. That's the first curious thing about this monument. Next, it's built out of huge stones, huge blocks of granite. It's what we call monolithic. They are not typical of the 19th dynasty, not typical of this period. They are monumental. Next, the blocks seem to be on a man-made island and are surrounded by water. It looks like a very ruined temple surrounded by a moat. And indeed, it is a moat. It's an artificial moat that was supplied by water from the Nile by underground pipes. So it's an intentional surrounding of the temple by water. It's called the Osirion because many people believe that it was intended as a kind of sacri sacrificial or almost reverential burial of the god Osiris. Remember, according to the myth, Osiris was hacked into many pieces by his evil brother Seth. Then Isis reassembled Osiris, breathes life into him, speaks the magical words, and he becomes one again. Now, many people say in the myth, there's versions of the myth, one version says that Osiris was finally buried at Abydos, the entire body. So we have this Osirion as a kind of false burial. It's a physical burial for a mythological character. Osiris was buried here, and that's the purpose of this monument, to commemorate the burial of Osiris on holy ground at Abydos. Another version of the myth, by the way, says that Osiris' head was buried at Abydos, and that could also account for this monument. One of the names of Osiris is he who sleeps in the water. He who sleeps in the water. Because remember, part of him was thrown into the waters of the Nile. So it makes some sense to think about a strange burial place at Abydos, the sacred city, surrounded by water. So these are some of the stranger aspects of this monument. But I haven't gotten to the theories yet about what was it used for, really, or who built it. The first theory, which I think most Egyptologists subscribe to, most, it was built by Seti I. It's right behind his temple at Abydos. That's one reason. But there's better reason for thinking that Seti built it. The monument was originally reached. It's, it's ruined. It's damaged. But it was originally reached by a covered tunnel. And on the walls of this tunnel are religious texts, the Book of the Gates. Now, the Book of the Gates was crucial to anyone wanting to get to the next world. And pharaohs had the Book of the Gates carved on their tombs. It gave you the magical words to go through doorways to the next world. There would be guardians, and at each gate, there would be someone else, and you'd have to know the password. The Book of the Gates gave you those passwords. So they were crucial. And on the wall of this tunnel leading to this strange monument, we have the Book of the Gates inscribed by Seti. No question about it. So it seems as if Seti built this monument to Osiris, perhaps, and carved his name on the walls. Now, one other, along with this theory, there's a kind of side theory that some people have suggested a different use for this. Built by Seti, but a different use. It's been suggested that Seti left his sarcophagus here and all his funerary equipment until it was time for his burial in the Valley of the Kings. That by keeping the sarcophagus and the empty canopic jars and all of that material, he would associate himself with Osiris and, like Osiris, resurrect in the next world. So, built by Seti, maybe as a cenotaph for Osiris, maybe just to house Seti's funerary equipment till he's going to be buried. That's theory one. Most people subscribe to that. It's built by Seti I. Let me give you theory two, my theory. So naturally, this is the one that's correct. My theory is that it wasn't built by Seti I, that it's a much earlier monument. 
and let me give you the reasons for this theory, and then you decide. First, the temple at Abydos that Seti built, not the Osirian, but the real temple, the main temple, doesn't follow the ordinary plan of an Egyptian temple. Egyptian temples are usually built on a single axis, like a railroad flat. It goes straight. First you might have the open courtyard, then you might have the enclosed courtyard, and then you might have the Holy of Holies where the statue of the god was kept. But basically, it's a three-part temple on a straight line. This temple at Abydos doesn't go straight. It goes straight back for a while, but then just before the Osirian, it goes left. It is shaped like an L, like an L. Now, why shape this temple like an L? My feeling, my suggestion, is that Seti was building the temple at Abydos. This ancient monument was covered over by sand. It's 30 feet below ground level, covered over by sand. They start building the temple back, and they discover this monument. They make the temple go left, and then Seti, wanting to take credit for this great ancient monument, carves his inscription on the tunnel wall leading down to the monument. So I think Seti, it's discovered in Seti's time and then claimed by Seti as his monument. But let me give you more evidence for this. There's, there's a little more evidence. Look at those stones. They're huge monolithic, if you remember. Remember I told you that they were very, very large stones? Never, never do you get that kind of building in the time of Seti I. The only monument that looks like, that looks like the Osirian, is the valley temple of King Kefren of the Old Kingdom. Same architecture, huge stones with larger ones going across them. Only in the valley temple of Kefren of the Old Kingdom do we get that. So I think the architecture suggests that it's a much older monument. And let me give you one more reason for agreeing with me. There is a restoration on the Osirian. A block of granite cracked. And the block was repaired in ancient times. And the way you repair granite sometimes is by what we call a butterfly clamp. You, across the crack, you carve out something in the shape of a butterfly, you have another little plug, and you plug it in, and it holds the two blocks together. But it's called a butterfly clamp. There is one block that cracked, and it's repaired in this traditional ancient way with a butterfly. Now the block is, is a dark granite, and the butterfly is a light granite. And inscribed on the little butterfly insert to hold the block together is Seti's name. Now many people suggest, see, it shows Seti built this monument. I think it's just the opposite. If you were building something and it broke and you had to repair it, you would repair it so you couldn't see the repair. That's what the ancient Egyptians did. They always did it so you can't see the repair. So I think the fact that Seti is repairing it with a butterfly of the different color and then putting his name on it, he's taking credit for repairing an ancient monument. He's not building a new thing and then repairing it and putting a, his name on a repair. So I think, just, just a suggestion, that this is actually a very ancient monument, built as indeed the tomb of Osiris. But it was lost in time, covered by sands, and Seti rediscovers it. Just a theory. But anyway, Seti dies and is indeed buried in the Valley of the Kings. On his ceiling, he has an astronomical ceiling. It's beautiful. The goddess Newt and all the, all the signs of the zodiac are up there. It's quite beautiful, painted blue. But even more astounding was his sarcophagus translucent alabaster, and on it, the Book of the Gates. This was discovered, I mentioned it once before, by Belzoni, an Italian strongman, who brought this sarcophagus to England to sell and offered it to the British Museum. They refused it, and it was bought, and it's now in the museum called John Soane's Museum in London, and you can see it in that museum. But Seti, when he died, had prepared his son to become king of Egypt and he would do it well. That son is Ramses the Great, and we'll talk about him next time.